Aeneas lived at the end of the second century. He was from Asia Minor in uh, probably Smyrna. He was a disciple of St. Polycarp. He remembers sitting at Polycarp's feet as a young man, memorizing his words, as Polycarp himself would talk about how he had spoken with the Apostle John, John the Evangelist. And so you've got this living tradition, John, Polycarp, Irenaeus. Yeah? And it really is that living tradition of theology which is really profound, goes all the way back to the beginning, but then suddenly flourishes with Irenaeus. We, we've got the Gospel from John, we've got the letters, got the Apocalypse, we've got one letter from Polycarp, there may be other writings that are attributed to him, but suddenly at the end of the second century, you've got this huge work by Irenaeus called Against the Heresies, three volumes, five volumes Against the Heresies, and in that, for the first time, you've got a really self-conscious, reflective, sophisticated understanding of orthodoxy, what scripture is, what the canon is, what the tradition is, what succession is, and all of these elements, are, we're going to read about them as he first deploys them. They're all put in service of um, theology, a theology which is sketched out all the way from Adam to Christ. Okay? So he's going to be our touch board this evening for trying to understand what is meant by tradition. Okay. But we're going to start a little bit earlier than that, or a little bit later than that. So when you hear the word tradition, and you ask a question about scripture and tradition and so on, what do you think? When you hear the word tradition, what does it mean to you? Nothing. <laughs> Church fathers. Church fathers, meaning what? Just history, that which is old, anything more than that? What was passed down? Okay. And so that which is passed down. So the word tradition simply means the handing over. Yeah? In Greek, it's the word parathesis, and it literally means handing over. The, you can use it as a verb as well, to tradition, to hand over. Okay? So you've got the, you know, the, the action and the content, that, the handing over and the content. Um, what about the relationship between tradition and customs? Is there a distinction for you between tradition and customs? Or not? Sometimes people make a distinction between tradition with a capital T and tradition with a sm traditions with a small t. Yeah? Traditions with a small t are things that we um, might do. Doesn't really matter if we don't do, but tradition with a capital T, that's holy tradition, that's this, that, and the other. Is that a distinction you're familiar with? What would you say the relationship between tradition and scripture is? Helps us interpret scripture on the basis of what? Okay. How would you know whether what's been passed down is true or not? Yeah? One of the early fathers, Cyprian of Carthage, he said, tradition without truth is nothing but the antiquity of error. Okay? Just because it's old doesn't make it true. There are plenty of things which get handed down which probably better not. Yeah? And so, you know, so with all that which is being handed down, we're always in the need to kind of sift through it. What really is of the truth and what is a local custom which, you know, it may be nice or may not be nice or whatever it might be. We don't just simply receive at blank value. Yeah, we, we've always got to sift, we've always got to think through it. And likewise, with regard, as we'll see when Irenaeus does it, similarly with him, we've got to think through all of this. Okay, let's turn our attention to Scripture for a minute, especially the New Testament. Can you think of how the word tradition is used in the New Testament? Because now maybe we can make it much more specific. Is it just anything that's been handed down? Or is it something specific that's been handed down? Yeah? Can anybody think, the Apostle Paul, where he uses the word tradition, although it's probably not the word tradition, it's probably not that in the English language if you're reading English tra text 
Is that way? Yeah, where's the reference? Yeah, getting there. Getting First Corinthians 15. We're not pushing with this. Paul uses an expression, and he only uses it twice. So you've got one of them. It's twice. Yeah? He says, I handed down to you what I received. That's really a technical formula. Yeah? He uses it in Corinthians 15 and Corinthians 11. Okay? In Corinthians 11, he says, I handed down to you. It is, is paredoke in mean. Uh, literally, I traditioned to you what I received. That Christ died in accordance... Uh, Corinthians 11. I, Corinthians 11. I, I delivered to you what I received from the Lord himself. That in the night in which he was given up, he took bread, broke it, said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Yeah? So one thing which is literally handed down from the apostle traditioned from the apostle, so both content and action of, of handing over, and this time it's from the Lord himself, is that in the night in which he was given up, he took bread, broke it, do this in remembrance of me, this is my body. As often as you do this, you, you proclaim my death until I come. Okay? That's one very concrete thing of tradition, I handed down what I received from the Lord himself. The other one is in... Um, Corinthian, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died in accordance with Scripture and he was raised in accordance with Scripture. Okay? That's the two times he used that formula. Died in accordance with Scripture, was raised in accordance with Scripture, and the breaking of the bread. Okay, why might that be important? The second one is so important that he uses a phrase twice. I delivered to you what I received. Christ died in accordance with Scripture. He was raised in accordance with Scripture. Yeah, the, the reference to Scripture is so important it's twice. What Scripture is he talking about? Old Testament, yeah? Um, when we say in the Nicene Creed, Christ died and rose in accordance with Scripture, what are we talking about? Old Testament. Yeah, we're not talking about we're not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul's not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They haven't been written when he's writing that letter. Yeah, it's a scripture. So the two things that the apostle says he hands down to us, one of them comes from the Lord Himself, is breaking of the bread. This is my body, and the death and resurrection in accordance with Scripture. Okay, are you with me so far? Those are the two things. Can you think of who was, which among the evangelists was Paul's disciple? St. Luke, yeah? So can you think in Luke of anything that reflects those two points we just heard in, from Paul, his teacher? Anyone? Uh, what, how does that reflect this particular thing? These two particular things? Anybody else? Okay, let's go through this just because it will help drive home particular points I want to make. In, I'm sure some of you have heard me talk about this before, um, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three Gospels, okay, coming in Luke, we call them the Synoptic Gospels. Why do, we, do you know why we call them Synoptic Gospels? They, they've got a kind of a similar scope, yes, uh, similar vision, similar scope. Um, how do the disciples know who Christ is? Who Christ is? They're, they're walking around with him, yeah, they're walking around, they, they, they see him doing miracles. In Matthew and Luke, they've met his mother. They, they've, you know, they, whatever she's got to tell them, they've heard it and all the rest of it, yeah? They are 
they go up the mountain of Tabor and see him transfigured. They go up the mountain and he gives a sermon on the mount. They've heard about his baptism. They're with him doing all these things. Do they have any idea who he is? Just think about that for a minute. Do they have any idea who he is? There's one time when one of the disciples makes a confession. Do you remember who and where? Peter, where? If I go to Caesarea Philippi, will I find it? <laughs> okay, that sounds like a really odd question, I know. But I'm, well, I'm, I'm trying to provoke thought and discussion. If I, if I go to Caesarea Philippi, will I find it? No. Yeah? Where do I have to go to find it? Gospel, yeah. Where do I have to go to find it? Matthew 16. Yeah? The point I'm trying to make is, we, we've got to learn to think scripturally. Yeah? If I go to a geographical place called Caesarea Philippi, I won't find it there. I've got to go to Matthew 16, because that's where it's happening in Matthew 16 and similar passages in Mark and Luke. So let's go to Matthew 16 for a moment. What happens in Matthew 16? Do you remember what happens? Yeah. Who, who do people say that I am? Some say you're the prophet. Some say it turns to Peter and says, who do you say that I am? And what does Peter say? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. What does Christ say? Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but... A revelation from the Father, yeah? It's really interesting because what does, what, what's the point of that statement? The point of that statement is, it's not by physically seeing me. You know, six foot tall, five foot tall, crooked nose, long hair, whatever, whatever it might be. It's not by seeing me that you know this. It's not by flesh and blood. It's not through any of that. It's by a revelation from the Father that you know this. Do you know what the word revelation is in Greek? At that point? Anybody? It's, it's an apocalypse of the Father. An apocalypse, which literally means an unveiling. Yeah? So it's a, the Father has unveiled it and made it known to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The word apocalypse occurs all over the place, but we usually translate it as revelation, which is it's not quite the same thing, especially in modern English. Apocalypse. Just like the book at the, end of the gospel, at the end of the New Testament, the Apocalypse. Okay? And the word Apocalypse literally means to unveil. Okay. Um, after he says, you did not know it by flesh and blood, but by revelation from the Father. Then what does Jesus say? Not, he says one thing for He says, blessed are you, Peter on this rock I'll build my church whatever you bind, whatever you loose the gates of hell will never prevail against it then he says what you just said that by the way Peter I've got to go to Jerusalem to suffer then what happens no something happens before that Peter says that's not going to happen and Christ says get behind me Satan yeah to think about it, the only disciple to make a confession of faith about who Christ is and was just said to be blessed, the rock upon which I'll build my church and hell will never prevail against it. Next verse is called Satan. Yeah? Why is he called Satan? And he, Christ doesn't say, um, get out of him, Peter. Satan, come out of him. Or Peter, stop listening to Satan or anything like that. He just directly calls him Satan. Okay? Why? Trying to get Jesus between Jesus and the cross. Yeah. Okay, so they didn't know it from all of that. Um, we, we, we push through this. I know some of you have heard before, so we get to the text from Aeneas. Okay? The, when they see him on the cross, do they recognize who he is? What happens when they see him on the cross? So they don't understand who he is all the way through the ministry. When they see him on the cross, what happens? What, what, do, they, what do they do? Just, they, they run away. They scramble. They deny him. Peter says, I don't know the man. Yeah. When they see the empty tomb, what happens? 
When the women turn up early in the morning at the empty tomb, what do they say? What's happened? Has somebody stolen the body? They don't believe it. It takes an angel, you know, an empty tomb's ambiguous. Yeah, what's happened? It takes an angel to explain to them, don't you remember what he said? He would rise, go and tell his disciples he'll meet them at Galilee. Yeah? They go and tell the disciples. What do the disciples say? Ah, you got up too early this morning. You're crazy. Don't know what you're talking about. Okay? Then they meet the risen Christ, and what happens? They still don't get it. So just think about, just think about all of that. Apart from Peter, when he's made known by a revelation from the Father, and even then, two verses later, he's called Satan because he doesn't understand. They don't get it by being with him. They don't get it by seeing him on the cross. They don't get it by seeing the empty tomb. They don't get it by even seeing the risen Lord. Yeah? The two of them, and this is where we get back to the Gospel of Luke, Paul's disciple. Yeah? The two of them in the Gospel of Luke, they're walking in chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus. The risen Christ turns up, and what does he say? Or what do they say to him? No, no, no. What, what, first of all, what do they say? The risen Christ turns up. How long has it been since they last saw him? Three days? What do they say to him? Yeah, who are you? Are you a stranger? Yeah, three days. Who are you? Are you a stranger? Haven't you heard what's been going on? We were following this guy called Jesus, and we thought he was going to save us from Roman, Roman rule. And, well, he went and got himself killed, and we went to the tomb, we found it empty, we've got no idea what's going on. Yeah, they're telling the risen Lord that three days later. Yeah? What happens next? He opens to them the scriptures and shows what? Uh, that Moses and all the prophets spoke about how he had to suffer, to die, to enter into his glory. Yeah? Then what happens? Their hearts start to burn. They persuade him to stay the night. And then what happens? Before that, he breaks the bread. Their eyes are open. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. He disappears from sight. Okay? Now, why did I go through all of that? In the Gospel of Luke, Paul's disciple, how do the disciples know who Christ is? Breaking the bread and the opening of the scriptures, both in the light of the passion, yeah, after the passion, after the crucifixion and resurrection. Yeah? So how does that connect back to what we just saw in Paul? What were the two things we saw in Paul? Where Paul uses that word tradition. How does he use it? Go on, louder. Go on. <laughs> Opening of the scripture. To proclaim that Christ died in accordance with scripture and was raised in accordance with scripture. And to break the bread. Yeah? So the two things that Paul says, I delivered to you what I received from the Lord himself in the breaking of the bread, are the two things which the disciples are doing on the road to Emmaus. He opens the scripture and breaks the bread. Yeah? So the very way in which the disciples come to know the Lord are the two things which Paul says, I've traditioned to you. Does that make sense? Is that clear what's going on in that? Now, why is that important for us today? Why is that important for us? What do we do when we come to church? What do we do? We open the scriptures and we break the bread, yeah? And we open the scriptures. By opening the scriptures, I don't just mean the readings. It's the readings as well, but it's also the homilies. It's also the iconography. It's also the, the, the architecture. It's also the ritual that goes on. All of this form... All of that is a space which is formed by the opening of the scriptures, yeah? When we come to church, we're not coming to a pile of bricks that happen to be arranged this way. The church is a space formed by the opening of the scriptures. It's a matrix, yeah? 
formed by the opening of the scriptures. And so when we come to church, that's what we're coming into, and it culminates in what? The Eucharist, the breaking of the bread. Yeah? So when we come to church, we are doing exactly the same as what the disciples did on the road to Emmaus. Yeah? Exactly the same. And those are things that Paul delivered. Opening the scriptures to proclaim him the crucified one who's known in the breaking of the bread. Yeah? So when we come to church, we are literally on the road to Emmaus. Yeah? We are, just think further what that means. We are not at a disadvantage because we are 2,000 years later. Yeah? Were they at an advantage by being there then? Were the disciples at an advantage by being there on the day? Did they get it from being there on the day? How did they get it? And opening the scripture, I'm going to make you repeat it just so it really drives home, yeah? Opening the scriptures and breaking the bread, which is exactly what we do. So the 2,000 years in between doesn't count for anything, yeah? Um, sometimes when I talk like this, a student would say, well, I would have known, yeah, you know. I, I ask the students, if you've been in Jerusalem in the year 25 AD or 30 AD, having a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you know, and you saw Jesus walking down the street, would you have said, oh, there goes the word of God? <laughs> would you? <laughs> would you? So when students put their hand up or other people put their hand up and say, well, I would, I say, well, you must be demonically possessed. <laughs> you know? Because only the demonically possessed get it, not the disciples. Yeah? How do the disciples get it? Opening the scripture and the breaking of the bread. Okay? Um, which is what we do, no distance. When we break the bread, what do we do with it? Eat it, yeah? And what, we, we don't keep it, like we keep some for the sick if need be, yeah? but, but we don't keep it for veneration, we eat it. And what happens when we eat it? Uh, not quite, we become the body, yeah? Well, if we become the body, isn't that why he disappears? Yeah? Because if I could see him somewhere else, how could I be his body? Yeah? So as soon as we recognize him, we become his body. Okay? And there's a lot more you can say about that. But let's go back to this. this. So the two central elements of tradition are what? Oh, I'm going to make you say it again and again and again because I really want you to make, you know, to, to know that you will have gone home having at least grasped these two points. Opening the scriptures in the light of the passion to speak about the crucified one, yeah? And the breaking of the bread. Those are the two things. So does that give us an insight into how scripture and tradition might relate? Yeah? Paul traditions that Christ died in accordance with Scripture, was raised in accordance with Scripture. Okay? Now let's just explore that for a minute. What are the Scriptures there? Is it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No, it's what? It's the Old Testament. Why do we call it the Old Testament? Uh, not quite. There was an Old Covenant, the New Covenant, but to refer to the books as the Old Testament. He calls it, what does he actually call it? Christ died in accordance with Scripture and was raised in accordance with Scripture, yeah? I'm, 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 getting, I'm beginning to be on a bit of a crusade about this. And I think I'm going to be ever more on a crusade in the future. I would really like people to stop using the word Old Testament. If the word scripture was good enough for the apostle, and it's good enough for the evangelists, and it's in the Nicene Creed, that seems pretty sufficient to me. Yeah? When we talk about scripture, what are we talking about? Primarily, what are we talking about? 
the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. Yes, we have, we'll come to this in a minute. Yes, we do call the writings of the New Testament scripture as well, but they all refer back to the scriptures, don't they? Yeah? This is done that scripture might be fulfilled. Yeah? So they, even when we call the writings of the New Testament the scripture, they still refer, they, they themselves refer back to the scriptures. So there's a sense in which the scriptures are primarily what we call the Old Testament. What happens when we call it the Old Testament? When, when you use the word Old Testament, what does it make you think? Out of date, old, all the rest of it, yeah? And so when we read the Old Testament, the scriptures, we tend to read it as what? The history of the people from the beginning leading up to the time of Jesus. Should we read it that way? How did the apostle read it? As speaking of whom? Christ, of the crucified and risen one, yeah? Um, so you've got the image of the book is opened. Another way of thinking about it, before the apostle Paul was called Paul, what was his name? Saul. And what was he doing? Persecuting the Christians, yeah? Did he know the scriptures? Did the scriptures lead, did his understanding of the scriptures lead him to Christ? No. He, he was reading the scriptures like a really good, devout, first century rabbinic scholar would. Yeah, as, a, as a good Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said. Was he waiting for a savior? Did, was he? Didn't he say in, in the letter to the Philippians, I was blameless under the law. Yeah, I was blameless. I kept the law perfectly, he says. Yeah, and you Christians, you got it so wrong, I'm going to persecute you. He then encounters Christ, and then what happens? God reveals to him, he's blinded, his eyes are opened, and he now re turns, goes back to the scripture and he reads it differently. Yeah? So he uses the language in, in the second letter to the Corinthians, he uses the language of a veil lay over scripture, or over Moses. Just like Moses had a veil over his head when he came down from the mountain, that same veil lies over the head of, uh, lies over, the, over Moses when it's read. Unless you turn to the Lord, and then the veil is removed and you can see the gospel. Yeah? So you've got two images then. You've got the image of scripture as a book which has to be opened and a book which is veiled and has to be unveiled. That's the language of apocalypse. It's unveiling. Yeah? Um, let's just think through what that means. Yeah? We are so used to this book. The Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Scripture, we don't really think about it. We open up, up its pages and we just start reading and whatever else it might be. Okay? But there are plenty of books. Why is this one Scripture and the others not? Yeah, there are plenty of ancient books. Why is this Scripture and the other one not? Wrong on both accounts. Yeah, we, see, we automatically think the church chose what scripture? Yeah, well, maybe with regard to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, but did it choose whether to accept the five books of Moses? Isaiah, the Psalms, did it? How? Oh, sure, there, there, there are lots of all sorts of things, but remember, that the gospel from the beginning is proclaimed in accordance with what? The scripture. The scriptures are given from the beginning. Yeah? Moses and all the prophets spoke about me. Okay, so the scripture is, meaning the Old Testament, at least the core of it. Yes, the edges are fuzzy. Enoch. Yeah? Um, but the core of it is a given from the beginning. The church didn't choose whether to accept the five books of Moses or choose whether to accept Isaiah. It's a given 
And it's only because we've got those books that the gospel could be proclaimed. We did that just now, didn't we? It's only because we've got those books that the disciples could know who Christ is. They didn't know by being there with him. They didn't know by seeing him on the cross. They didn't know by seeing the empty tomb. They didn't get it. It's only when these books are opened that they get it. Okay? So there is no, strictly speaking, from the point of view of the proclamation of the gospel, there is no period before which there's no reference to scripture. No reference to scripture. Scriptures are given from the beginning. Yeah? Now, with regard to choosing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's a different question. But if your focus was on the church chose whether to accept scripture, and by scripture you mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, letters of Paul, and so on, then effectively you've forgotten these scriptures, which is what we tend to do today. We're basically Martianite. Yeah, we're only concerned with the scriptures, meaning the New Testament. And we forget that, and we say, well, the church, was, the church came into existence before Paul even wrote his letters, or before the Gospels were written. And so Paul and his letters are written within the church, and the church could choose which ones. We've completely forgotten that the Gospel is proclaimed in accordance with scripture from the beginning. Yeah? We've forgotten that because we treat it as Old Testament, we forget about it. Yeah? Effectively today, we're Martianite. And actually, one could go, go further. Given what we've seen about the road to Emmaus and so on and so on, what are the primary texts you should be reading if you want to encounter Christ? What are the primary texts? Is it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or is it Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, the Psalms, and so on? What are the most important texts for encountering Christ? Yeah, think about that. We automatically think, because we are so bound up with thinking of the Old Testament as Old Testament, that's, that the Old Testament is all about the stuff before Jesus. And if you want to know about Jesus, well, you turn to the Gospels. But no. Those who wrote the Gospels tell us they only know him because of these texts. Yeah? And the baking of bread, obviously. But they, they tell us only about reference to these texts. And they write their Gospels with reference to these texts. So if we want to know him, we've got to go to these texts. In the way that the evangelist did, in the way that the apostle did, we're only concerned with the scriptures, meaning the New Testament. And we forget that, and we say, well, the church, was, the church came into existence before Paul even wrote his letters, or before the Gospels were written. And so Paul and his letters are written within the church, and the church could choose which ones. We've completely forgotten that the Gospel is proclaimed in accordance with Scripture from the beginning. Yeah? We've forgotten that because we treat it as Old Testament, we forget about it. Yeah? Effectively today, we're Martianite. Actually, one could go, go further. Given what we've seen about the road to Emmaus and so on and so on, what are the primary texts you should be reading if you want to encounter Christ? What are the primary texts? Is it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or is it Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, the Psalms, and so on? What are the most important texts for encountering Christ? Yeah, think about that. We automatically think, because we are so bound up with thinking of the Old Testament as Old Testament, that's, that the Old Testament is all about the stuff before Jesus. And if you want to know about Jesus, well, you turn to the Gospels. But no. Those who wrote the Gospels tell us they only know him because of these texts. Yeah? and the baking of bread, obviously. But they, they tell us only about reference to these texts. And they write their Gospels with reference to these texts. So if we want to know him, we've got to go to these texts. In the way that the evangelist did, in the way that the apostle did. The second point is, the Council of Nicaea did nothing of the sort. Absolutely nothing of the sort. There is no canon of the Council of Nicaea which says these are the books of Scripture and these are not. 
yeah? None of the ecumenical councils, whether you just want to count the first or the latter, Eastern, Oriental, Orthodox, and so on, none of the Oriental councils, the ecumenical councils, were called to determine the limits of scripture. They weren't. You've got local councils, Council of Ansari, the Council of Laodicea, various other ones, whereas one of the many rulings that they produce, and not the first, would be a list of scripture. You also have letters from particular bishops, letter of St. Athanasius, letter of St. Gregory of Nazianzus, letter of Amphilochius of Iconium, that give, let, that give lists, and they're all different. Literally, they're all different. It's not the issue. It's really not the issue. The Ethiopian church today has got the Book of Enoch in their scriptures. The Armenian church has got a third letter to the Corinthians. Is that an issue for church reunion? Is it? Um, the focus on delimiting which books of scripture and to get a particular list, that's a Reformation and post-Reformation phenomena. Yeah? And then you get into Sola Scriptura and you get into all that kind of thing. Okay? The reason why it's not an issue, just think about what we saw earlier. I asked you, when Paul, before he converted, he was called Saul. How was he reading scripture then? Was he reading as speaking about Christ? He was reading as a good pharisaical Jew would, and it led him to persecute the church. After he encounters Christ, how does he read the scripture? Completely differently, yeah? What's changed? Literally, what's changed? His eyes were open. His starting point has changed, yes? He's encountered Christ, and his starting point has changed. So what's at issue throughout the whole of the early church, all the way through, and still for us as Orthodox, what is at issue is that starting point which, who's spoken of by these books. Yeah, that's the issue. This starting point, this Jesus Christ. Is he truly God? Is he truly human? Is he, you know, one? Is he two? All, all the kind of debates that the councils were called to debate. Yeah? The starting point's determinative for how you read it. Paul read it one way, he read it another way. The text didn't change. You can use the language of, it's unveiled, his eyes are opened, the book has been opened, they're all saying the same thing. His starting point has changed. It's a starting point which is a key thing. And that's why all theological reflection is about that. Yeah? Not the list of the books. So really, you can actually say that um, it's best to think of the books of Scripture as being like a field, or a circular field. There's some that are absolutely core. Cool. Five books of Moses, yeah, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the Psalms, no doubt about it, absolutely central. There are others which are much more on the periphery. Enoch, yeah? Has anybody here read Enoch? Uh, it's, a, it's a fun read, um, but there are much better things to do as well. Um, although Enoch is referred to by Peter, yeah? Well, there you go. Um, and, and then other books that are kind of on, on the periphery. And then you get into debates about those, where they should be read, where they should not be read, and so on. But that's not really the issue. You've got the core books, and it's by reference to the core books that Christ is proclaimed. So, if I'm not clear, do, do stop me, okay? Um, if you've got any questions, stop me. I've been asking you questions. Feel free to ask me questions. Um, Let's just think a little bit more about then what is involved in the reading of Scripture. Still Scripture. We're still talking about what we call Old Testament. Yeah? The Scriptures. There are, there are, and, and, and why Scripture is different to this book. Uh, so why this book is different to all other kinds of books. So it's been a long day. What makes Scripture Scripture? It's not simply that the church has said this, because the church hasn't. Actually hasn't in any kind of ecumenical council, so on and so on. 
The gospel is proclaimed according to scripture from the beginning. Okay. There are four characteristics that make, that, that characterize scripture as scripture. And we need to bear them in mind when we read the text. Otherwise, we're going to misread it. Four characteristics that make scripture, that, that, that indicate, uh, that characterize scripture as scripture. Firstly, they're cryptic. Cryptic. What's another word for cryptic? Pardon? Mysterious, unclear. Yeah? Just think about it. The disciples had read the books all their lives. Paul had read all the books all their lives, and they didn't get the meaning. Yeah? They were cryptic. The book had to be opened. It's not that it physically had never been opened before, but it had to be opened. The meaning had to be revealed. The veil had to be lifted. So the books are cryptic. If they're not cryptic, they're not scripture. You never thought about it like that before, had you? Okay? Cryptic. Secondly, they are harmonious. They all talk about the same thing, believe it or not. When Christ opens the books, what does he show? We did this. Road to Emmaus. What, what does he show from the scripture? Yeah, Moses and all the prophets spoke about how the Son of Man had to suffer to enter into his glory. Okay? In other words, the books are closed. When they're opened, guess who they speak about? The one who opened it. Yeah? Because we're using, we're reading this material to understand him. Yeah? You know, we're, we're, looking, we're reading the Exodus account of the slaying of the lambs, for instance. Not to try and understand what was going on in Egypt 10,000 years ago. We're reading it to understand him. Yes? So, when the books are opened, it all speaks about him. Thirdly, um, they are contemporary. They are contemporary. What does Christ say? He says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote of me. Just think about that. We, we, we've read that so often. We've heard it so often. But just think what it means. Moses wrote of me. Not Moses wrote of things that happened thousands of years ago. Certainly it's in that form of things that happened thousands of years ago, but not if you read it unveiled. If you read it unveiled, you realize that Moses is talking about Christ the whole time. He is the true lamb. He is our exodus. He is the one who effects the true exodus in Jerusalem. He is the true Adam. You know, all of these things, they were actually being written about him. So cryptic, harmonious, Contemporary, yeah? The fourth point is a little bit more difficult, um, but, and has to be understood in a very particular way. The fourth point is that they are inspired. Yeah? Now, we all know, of course, of course the scriptures are inspired. Why make such a big deal about it? How does their inspiration, the inspiration of the book, relate to how you read it? What we tend to do is say, this is the Holy Bible, it's inspired, and it's inspired in whatever way I read it. Is that so? Another way of putting it would be to say, we tend to think of inspiration as being you know, a sporadic activity. God, whenever, 500 BC inspired um, Isaiah in the temple. Or before that, he inspired Moses or Jeremiah or whoever. God inspired the writer and then the writer wrote. Yeah? And we might get into the question of, well, did he really understand what he was writing or not? That's the kind of question we might think about, yeah? And then we would talk about how God inspires me today to read the scripture, as if they're different things. You know, that was way back then, this is today. 
I'm not sure it's so simple. I'm really not sure it's so simple. The point would be, I've got no idea at all what was in Moses' mind or Isaiah's mind when he was writing the book. I've got no idea. You've got no idea. We can guess, but I've got no, we've got no idea, yeah? But I know for an absolute fact, absolute fact, that nobody was reading Isaiah as speaking about a crucified Messiah born from a virgin until after the event. Isn't that so? Was Paul or anybody else waiting for a crucified Messiah to be born of a virgin? Nobody was. Only after the event, when the book is open, then we know what Isaiah is talking about. Yes? Does that make sense? Or am I getting... Okay. But that means then that you cannot separate the inspiration of Isaiah from the opening of the book by Christ. Yeah? And you cannot separate the inspiration of Isaiah from the opening of the book by Christ and our reading of the book today as speaking about Christ. All three belong together. Yeah? It is Christ who opens the book to show how he inspired Isaiah to write about himself to a reader who's similarly inspired. Yeah, the whole thing goes together. It's, it all turns upon Christ. He opens a book to show an inspired reader how the prophet was inspired to write about himself. Turns upon himself. Okay? So that means, that means, if you want to read scripture as scripture, how must you read it? You see, we just, we don't think about that. We just pick up the book and read it and think, well, let me just read it. I'm reading narratives about, I don't know, um, creation or Abraham or Exodus or the ten plagues or whatever, whatever it might be. We just read it. We don't think about it. We think we're reading a holy book without thinking about it. But if you want to read these books as scripture, not just as a history book or a book of religious instruction or whatever else it might be, but as scripture, how must you read it? Pardon? No. In, in exactly, I, I went through, I named four ways, four things. It's not just, prayer. It, it is. You must read it as cryptic, a book which has been opened by Christ to speak about himself. Yeah, you've got to do it prayerfully, no doubt about it. But you've got to be reading it as speaking about him. Moses wrote of me. Yes? If you want to read it as scripture, you are reading it as speaking about Christ. You can read it other ways. You can read it and try and find out what the history was going on in when the temple was built or whatever else. It, you, know, you can read about history if you want to, but that's not reading it as scripture. Is that really clear? Is, that, is there any question about that? You about to... That's fine. <laughs> well, you only... Yeah, uh, you, you're in exactly the same position. Thank you again for the question, because you're now able me to go into a whole load of other things, which is f fine by me. And frankly, it's really interesting you took the, the question, the example of Isaiah, yeah, and you said you didn't understand it. Yeah, no, that's fine. It, 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 but that's a really interesting point that you make there. Um, who else was reading the book of Isaiah and didn't understand? The Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. Yeah? <laughs> now we heard you're not a eunuch, we got that. <laughs> um, it's the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. But, but there's something very revealing in the way that the Ethiopian eunuch and the way that you um, were just speaking. Yeah? You asked a question, you didn't understand it. Our modern presupposition is that. A, a text has got a meaning. 
Yeah, we read a book and we ask, what does it mean? The me for us, the meaning lies in the book, yeah? And we think we've got to find the right reading strategy to get to the meaning which is in here somehow. Yeah? Uh, you've got to use allegory, you've got to use theory, you've got to read historical reading, wh whatever. You know, we've got all these different methods of reading. Okay? But that's, interestingly, that is not what the Ethiopian eunuch says. What does the Ethiopian eunuch say? He's, right, he's, re he's reading Isaiah um, about the suffering servant. Philip turns up and he asks what? What does it, what does it he doesn't understand? No. Go on. Yeah, the question is, who is he writing about? Yeah, that's a different question. Your question was, like, we were just saying, like, we tend to think the meaning is in here, and I've got to dig in here and find the meaning of this text which lies in it. Yeah? Whereas uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, Luke again, says the question is, who is it speaking about? Is it speaking about Jesus? Or is it speaking about Hezekiah? Or whoever else it might have been? Yeah? The question at issue is a point of reference. Not a meaning in the text. It's who it's speaking about, a point of reference. And for us, it is always speaking about Jesus. They read them with a completely different hypothesis. A completely different starting point. Yeah, our starting point is Christ, who opens the scripture and speaks about him. Their starting point could be something completely different, and there have been different ways throughout the centuries. There were different ways within Judaism in the first century. The way that the people in Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls people would have done it, is different to what Philo in Alexandria would have done, is different to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're all reading differently. Okay? But I do remember um, in New York, I teach at St. Vladimir's Seminary there. And um, in New York, we have, a, we have something called the Inter-Seminary Dialogue, where, we, where our students would meet up with students from other seminaries and we would talk about whatever. Yeah? We take a different topic for each, each um, semester. And that includes Jewish seminaries. Yeah? So there's a Jewish theological seminary, a rabbinical school. And I remember our students being really quite shocked one time. We were talking about the prophets, or Isaiah, or, or the scripture, or something like that. And they were to, our students were told by the Jewish students there, basically, we don't read the prophets today. Well, the prophets had a word for Israel in their own time. And that's gone. You know, they're reading it as... Isaiah or Jeremiah or whatever had a word to speak against Israel or towards Israel at that particular moment in history. And there you go. Done. It's not speaking to us today. Yeah? So it's a very different way of reading scripture. Their way of reading scripture as scripture is completely different to the way we read scripture as scripture. Because how do we read scripture as scripture? It speaks about whom? Duh, yeah? yeah, he's the one who opens the book and it speaks about him. That's, our, that's why it's scripture for us. That's what makes it scripture. So if you're not reading it that way, you're not reading it as scripture. Can I say that any more clearly? Or is that clearly enough? Okay. Oh, sure. Well, not something deeper. But he's wondering, who is it speaking about? Um, but th there were so many different ways. We, we tend to think of Judaism as being one thing. It really isn't until the second or third century. Yeah? You've got, you've got a hodgepodge of all sorts of different things. You've got people in the Dead Sea Scrolls doing whatever they're doing. You've got Philo in Alexandria doing whatever he's doing. You've got the Pharisees, you've got the Sadducees, you've got all sorts of different groups. All with different expectations and all with different hopes and expect, you know, and battles between them over all these different things. Yeah, what we know as Judaism is really what emerges after the fall of the temple into rabbinic Judaism, and it takes a while to get there. Okay, um, yeah. So 
The apostle, just to recap what we've done, we'll see what we want to do after that. The apostle hands over traditions, the preaching of Christ crucified and risen in accordance with scripture, and he hands over, he traditions, the breaking of the bread. And this tradition he's received from the Lord himself. Those are without any doubt whatsoever the central element of the tradition. Okay? They're what we still do today. We see it in the road to Emmaus. We are on the road to Emmaus. Now this tradition is always preached in accordance with Scripture. And now we've looked at what Scripture is and how it's opened and all the other kind of things we've been looking at here. And Scripture there is what we call Old Testament. Okay? But I preferred if we didn't. Um, I don't know if I have any effect on that. Um, that preaching of Christ crucified and risen in accordance with the scripture is what the apostles preached and then wrote down. So what we've got in the four gospels are all presented as the crucified and risen one in accordance with the scripture. So the first gospel to be written is what? Generally reckoned to be Mark. How does it start? No. The, the, literally the opening words. The very opening words of the gospel. The beginning, the archi of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it says in Isaiah. <laughs> okay? Behold, I send my messenger before me, make the way straight, and so on. Yeah? Prepare the way. So to the very beginning of the first gospel written, taking you straight back to Isaiah. Matthew and Mark, everything in Matthew and Mark is, this is done that this might be fulfilled. This is done that this might be fulfilled. In the gospel of John, you've got very straightforwardly, if you, Christ saying, if you believe Moses, you believe me because... He wrote of me, yeah? So what we've got in the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the crucified and risen Christ as proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with the Scripture, okay? So tradition is always with respect to the Scripture it, that the apostles are preaching. It finds written form in the Gospels, in the epistles. They're gradually collected together. Um, but only those Gospels, interestingly. The scriptures. Yeah, the scriptures. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we shouldn't start with the New Testament. But at the same time, I mean, I'm thinking of, like, training rules, right? Like, the, the, the Gospels would be the Old Testament with the training rules still on. Like, the way to read the Old Testament, because this is how, you know... Absolutely. Is that... Oh, I would come to that. Uh, yeah, and as, 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 in, in fact, that's actually the very point I was going to come to. Um, <laughs> So, what, so but, but just to be back one step further back, what we tend to do is we read at the level of the narrative, yeah? And so when we read at the level of the narrative, we, of course, you know, we start with Genesis and, well, here's God creating and then this and this and this and this and then Exodus and this and this and this, and then we get to the end of that book and then we say, oh, here's the narrative about Jesus, yeah? And you've got the, you've got the, bio, the, the Gospels read as biography and then we get into the book of Acts, early church, and then we read the epistles, now that we know who Paul is and what he was doing in the early church, yeah? And we think that when we read at that level of the text, the plain narrative, we think we are being historical, yeah? We're following the history. But actually, we are not being historical. To do it historically, what would you do? What would your starting point be? What happened first? The writing of Paul, the writing of the Gospels, or the Passion of Christ? Which happens first? No. The Passion of Christ, the Gospels, or Paul? The Passion of Christ. So historically, the Passion of Christ is first. Yeah? And then, when's Paul writing his letters? <laughs> 
so within 20 years or whatever, after the Passion, yeah? So for 20 years, you've got the preaching. You, you've, got the, you've got the disciples and apostles reflecting on what had happened, and they're doing that by going back to Scripture. Yeah? What was he doing when he did this? Oh, Isaiah says this. Yeah? Have you ever noticed in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, there's a really, really fascinating passage um, in John 12. Where it actually tells you this is what we were doing. So John 12, 12, 12, okay? It says, it's talking about the entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, and so on, yeah? It says, the next day, a great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young ass and sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on an ass's cot. You're all familiar with that, yeah? Okay, it carries on. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered, what? Then they remembered that it had been written of him. Isn't that interesting language? It's not, then they remembered what he did. Yeah, or remembered with greater clarity what he did. Oh, yeah, he did that. No, they remembered it had been written. Okay? So after the Passion, after the Crucifixion, Ascension, Re Resurrection, Ascension, Pentecost, after, after the Passion, the whole event of the Passion, um, they spend, before Paul starts writing, it's some 20 years or whatever, where they are reflecting on what had happened by going back to the Scriptures. Yeah? Yeah, they've got all their memories. You know, we, we were doing this with him, his mother said this, whatever, what, you know, all these different memories. And their memories are shaped by the event of the passion. You know, when you have a cataclysmic event in your life, it changes how you look at your past. Yeah, you understand different aspects of it, yeah? So the, 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 their memory is shaped by the event of the passion and specifically by going back to the scriptures. You should really say it is a scripturally mediated memory in the light of the passion. Okay? So they're going back after the passion. They're going back to the scriptures. They say, oh, look what Isaiah says. Doesn't that fit him to a T? Or whatever else it might be. Yeah? Um, Paul is preaching the gospel, traveling around, doing this, that, and the other. The other apostles, disciples, also preaching whatever they're doing. And then... In the year 50-whatever, Paul starts writing letters. And then uh, he's been proclaiming the gospel. He, in his letters, he defends what he says. It's my gospel, according to my gospel, he says. Yeah? So the gospel has been preached for 20 years. And then we have the writing of the gospels. Yeah? So historically, it's passion with reference to scripture the epistles, the gospel. Yeah? That, that would actually be historical rather than that narratival letter, level. Yeah? Now what's really interesting is what order do we read it in in church? Pardon? We read it in the same way. We read the epistle before the gospel. Yeah? We have the Old Testament, I don't know how in the Coptic church you do it, but we have the Old Testament readings the night before or certainly before the right reading of, of Paul, then you get letters of Paul, then you get the Gospels. So in other words, Paul, the Gospel, gives us a key for hearing the Gospels. Yeah? So that's the way one should think about it. So what we then have in the Gospels is already an attempt to present the crucified and risen Christ in accordance with Scripture. Yeah? But it's not the complete picture. How does the Gospel of John finish? Yeah, you know, the, the world could not contain the number of books that, that could be written about him. It's not because he lived for an infinitely long time and did so many different things. It's that the books of Scripture, Old Testament, Law, Psalms, and the Prophets, can be explored in so many different ways to understand Christ and what he's doing. Yeah? So it's infinitely rich in that way, infinitely generative. And in fact, one can even say, contrary to our 
modern way of reading scripture, or, or, or any text where we think the meaning lies in the text, yeah, um, if the meaning lies in the text, there can only ever be one meaning, the fathers will say emphatically, any passage of scripture is capable of more than one meaning. Yeah? And then, you know, just to kind of paraphrase it, if there were only one meaning for any passage of scripture, well, write out the meaning and throw away the book. But then we would start debating what about the meaning of the meaning. Yeah? So we're always in the level of interpretation. But anybody who's preached, Father, you must know, you preach on the same, verse, same uh, reading year in, year out. Do you say the same thing each year? I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But, but the point is, you can always find something new to say from any passage, yeah? because there's infinite riches to come from it. So it's not as if there's only one meaning to any one text. So any, any text can be taken in all sorts of different ways. It's playful as you're proclaiming Christ with reference to it. Okay? Um, We're not going to get to read this, are we? This is it's quarter to eight. Uh, my, my guess is, I've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. I don't want to try your patience, but my guess is probably to finish off with a couple of things rather than trying to go through this as well. But this, everything we've done will help you go through this. I want to carry on with a suggestion you're making uh, just now about um, uh, the New Testament writings being, how do you put it, scripture with training wheels, yeah? So what we've got in the New Testament is... Um, already scriptural interpretation of this Christ presented to us. And it acts as a guideline for how to continue doing that. Yeah? Rather than reading the New Testament as being what happens next, Old Testament being the whole history up to this point, and then the New Testament is what happens next, the Fathers thought about it in really quite different terms. And Irenaeus, this guy here, um, he uses the word recapitulation. Yeah? What does the word recapitulation mean? Okay, I remember giving a whole lecture to my students 10 years ago on the topic of recapitulation. And then afterwards, a student came up to me and said, you know, if only you'd used the word recap, we would have known what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah? What's a recap? It's a summary. You all know the word recap. It's a summary. Yeah? That's exactly what the word recapitulation means. It's just, it's just rather grander. It's fancier. Yeah? Uh, that's actually the Greek word, anakephaleosis, recapitulatio. But it's got a very technical meaning, just like recap. When you recap something, are you saying anything different? But you're saying the same thing in a shortened form. Yeah? So in antiquity, the word recapitulation refers to the summing up speech that a lawyer would give.